facing up to her nuclear past, John Slater examines the human guinea pigs. Members of President Clinton's Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments and guests, I come to you as an angry and discouraged citizen. Words cannot adequately describe my inner feelings since learning I was a human test subject. The Veterans Administration discovered in my Air Force medical records, Department of Defense Form 1141, record of exposure to ionizing radiation. To the best of my knowledge, I was not advised I would be subjected to this testing, nor do I recall consenting as a participant. I gave this country over 30 years of my life in the military. I'm a retired Chief Warrant Officer, U.S. Army. At this point in time, I am no longer proud of my uniform nor the flag I served under. <clears throat> as far as I'm concerned, I was a participant in the American Holocaust. Ex-soldier Leslie Lynch publicly giving his heartfelt evidence to members of a special committee set up by President Clinton to investigate human radiation experiments in America. Most of these experiments have been secret and rarely had the subjects been told of what was being done to them. For 50 years America had fought the Cold War. Secrets and military experiments were part of that war, as Leslie Lynch has recently discovered. Indeed, the culture of the country was pro-nuclear and gung-ho. But slowly, that nuclear dream has died. Three Mile Island and Chernobyl showed that nuclear power had its downside. In this series, America Atomica, we take a look at the growing disenchantment there with all things nuclear. We show that as the truth finally emerges, America's love affair with the atom is nearly over. Many legal cases have now been brought by the victims and are slowly winding their way through the courts. Over the last two years, I have been tracking one particular case that is taking place in middle America, in Cincinnati, Ohio, and it's nearly over. This was quite a day. I think everybody there will say this is a day we will remember, along with many other critical days we've been through. But the courtroom was packed. There were 100 to 150 family members there. It was good to hear the family members speaking so eloquently once more about what had happened to their relatives. Legal cases like this started as soon as the secret experiments were made public. No one bothered to wait for the final report of the Presidential Advisory Commission on Human Radiation Experiments to give it its full name. But the Commission sent teams out to those cities where experiments were known to have taken place. Like in Cincinnati, where 88 people had been given large doses of radiation during the 1960s in a special basement room at the General Hospital, which was attached to the University of Cincinnati. The hearing in Cincinnati took place at the end of 1994. Over 30 people gave evidence that day, most of them family members of the 88 victims. But others, like Leslie Lynch, had come from all over the United States to tell their stories in the seven minutes they were allowed at the microphone. It was a long and grueling day. The stories were full of tears and anger, now that people were finally beginning to learn of what had been done to them or to their relatives. But there was no emotional rest as the witnesses came forward one after another. I, Doris Baker, am writing on behalf of my great-grandmother, Gertrude Newell, patient number 20, whom unknowingly was put into radiation experiment. I want you to know how I have been feeling about all of this mess. I hurt dearly. I can't get over this. I have read about what happened to babies, little children, pregnant women, mentally impaired people, and prisoners, most of which were black. Will someone please tell me why did our government let this happen? I'm sorry to have to tell Doris Baker that not only did the government allow such experiments to take place, but that it actively encouraged and funded them. Something like 4,000 radiation experiments were conducted all over America. The one in Cincinnati was much more important than the others. The government also used the cloak of national security to keep most of these experiments well away from prying eyes and public scrutiny. Indeed, many of them were classified top secret. Over the years, bits and pieces of information regarding radiation experiments had leaked out. 
but no one had pulled the story together, and so no one realised the scale and enormity of what had been done. It was finally a journalist who brought the scandal of radiation experiments to national prominence. Not an important journalist on a famous national paper like the New York Times or the Washington Post. No, this journalist worked for the Albuquerque Tribune, way down in New Mexico. This journalist was Eileen Wilson, and she was their neighbourhood correspondent. I recall it very well. It was 1987. It was the spring of 1987. I had just joined the paper several months earlier, and the Air Force was in the process of cleaning up its various uh, Air Force bases. So I went over to what was then called the Air Force Weapons Lab, and began to look through some of their animal experiment reports. In the back of one of these reports, I found a footnote referencing human beings who had been injected with plutonium, and I was stunned. That Monday, I returned to the paper and told the city editor I had a fantastic story that there were these 18 Americans who had been injected with plutonium. And he told me, well, Eileen, that's a good story but we hired you to be the neighborhood reporter. So I was quite furious at that point, and I started assembling a file on my own. And in between other assignments, I would collect my data and do my interviews and file my freedom of information requests. And this went on for years. It was, uh, it was Eileen's long shot, okay? And my goal was to find these 18 people and I knew that it, was, it, that it was all but impossible, but there was just something that wouldn't let me let it go. And so in, 19, in the summer of 1992, I got a, a roster of horrible assignments, and I thought to myself, well, I'm not going to do any of these. I'm going to go back to my plutonium experiment. So I went to my office, opened up my file, was looking at some of my documents, and as, I, as my eye was reading down the page, I noted this one line, and it said, it was talking about a particular physician, and it said, contacted the physician of Cal-3 in Italy, Texas. All the plutonium patients had code numbers. The patients who were injected in California were called Cal-1, 2, and 3. Right then, a light bulb went off in my head because I knew that if the physician lived in Italy, Texas, possibly Cal-3 did too, and that I could find this man in such a small town, and I found him within five minutes. How? Oh. Well, I called Italy City Hall. Italy is a small town south of Dallas, and I said I was looking for an African-American man about 70 or 80 years old who had had his left leg amputated, and they said, oh, you must be looking for Elmer Allen. And I so said, easy. yes, and I, and he, they said, he died a year ago. Would you like his wife's number? And I said, yes, yes. And that was the beginning of the end of the story. The fact that 18 people had been given plutonium injections had long been known, but no one had known the identity of a single one of those 18. What Eileen Wilson did by sheer doggedness was to put names and faces to those people who had been hidden and depersonalized with code names like Cal-3. She found their stories and gave them a history. Publication day for the paper, and for Eileen Wilson, was November the 15th, 1993. For a couple of days, little or nothing happened, but suddenly the story broke big in Washington, D.C., and both Eileen and the Albuquerque Tribune became justly famous. Maybe the story might still have been forgotten again, but for a most extraordinary happening the government responded rapidly and publicly. It also responded with candor and shock. This was because the person running the Department of Energy, which had become responsible for all these experiments, was Hazel O'Leary. I'm shocked, uh, appalled, and this has been expressed by many uh, with respect to these revelations involving American citizens who apparently are the least able to protect themselves, uh, poor people, prisoners, um, retarded youth in an institution. Uh, the frightening piece of this is that these are the weakest among us, and uh, the standard of principle that I understand says that those are the folks who deserve the highest order of protection 
and it appears that the government could not and did not provide that protection. That's shocking to all of us. Hazel O'Leary's public condemnation of the experiments led directly to President Clinton setting up the advisory committee. But immediately more important was the admission that there had been a great number of experiments in different places up and down the land. This caused journalists to dig out the secrets in their own patch. The story grew and grew. Eileen Walsam has spent the last two and a half years writing a book, gathering information on all the radiation experiments. She now knows why, back in 1944, the leaders of the Manhattan Project had to find out, with the greatest urgency, what plutonium did inside the human body. It became clear to me, after doing a lot more research, that there were legitimate scientific purposes to the experiment. Los Alamos, as one scientist described it to me, the place was so contaminated, it was as if you were baking a cake with flour, and the flour had spread throughout the lab. The lab itself was completely contaminated. People were walking out, going home, walking into their houses with plutonium on the bottoms of their shoes, in their hair. There was plutonium that was seeping down the canyons. There was plutonium in the Rio Grande by September of 45. And keep in mind that plutonium was only discovered in 1941-42. So that's a pretty fast spread. And... The scientists who engineered the injection program were deathly afraid of a cancer epidemic developing. That's very clear from the documents. And they felt that they could not get the data that they needed from the rats and that they had to inject human beings with plutonium in order to find out how much was in a worker's body or their bodies, for that matter. She understands the why of plutonium experiments, but in no way does Eileen Walsam condone the how. And from early top-secret documents, she has charted the whole process of experimentation that started at the end of World War II. Another of the radiation experiments which had been known about for a long time had taken place in Cincinnati. Between 1960 and 1971, 88 people had been given partial or whole-body radiation. Throughout this period, the experiment had been run by Dr. Eugene Sanger and funded to the tune of $50,000 a year by the Department of Defense. Extraordinarily, this experiment had been stopped way back in 71 when a university lecturer in English literature, of all things, called Martha Stevens, had learnt about it. She demanded, and even more surprisingly, got the details of the experiment. She blew the whistle and cried foul, and that, for the moment, was that. We were able to get some publicity, but not nothing here in Cincinnati. The local press would not tell people that we had charged people had died of radiation at our general hospital. And so uh, no one had a chance to read in the papers that people were radiated, and so no one came forward to say, my aunt, my mother has, just, has been irradiated, or I myself, because there were still victims living at that time. There's only one now living, but there would have been many still living in 71. So we, of course, were able to help stop these radiations. Our report helped to stop it. But we didn't take the further step of trying to find the people because we didn't know what we would do with them if we did find them. I thought of them as our invisible people. I've sometimes said they were the invisible army that fought by night, that is, in ignorance of what had, had happened to them. I never expected to hear any more about it after the radiation stopped and no more funding came from the Defense Department. We thought we had to be content with that and then we would never hear any more about it. But as you know, everything flared up again because of the publicity over the plutonium injections to begin with. And suddenly a reporter here in town called me and allowed me to tell this truth that I had never been able to tell in this town before. So at the beginning of 1994, 23 years after she had stopped the experiment, the Cincinnati story reopened for Martha Stevens, and for an awful lot more people as well. Martha now began to put names and faces to the initials and numbers used by the doctors to hide the identity of these test subjects. As with Eileen's plutonium victims, this was the story which hit the front pages of the Cincinnati newspapers. Those headlines caused other families to come forward and identify relations who had unknowingly become part of this experiment. 
It was decided by the families that they would take legal action against the doctors and against the hospital and against the city of Cincinnati and, if they could find a way to do it, against the government who had funded the experiment. So the families banded together as a group to form a class action. One of their lawyers who worked on the case was Bob Newman. What we're pressing on is the fact that the United States government uh, and Dr. Sanger sponsored and conducted human guinea pig experiments for military purposes that subjected uh, people to full and partial body radiation and caused great injury to a number of people. Uh, their skins were burned black. This is not any kind of therapeutic radiation. It wasn't done for their uh, for the cancers that they had. It had nothing to do with treatment. Dr. Sanger wasn't even their doctor. It was not a patient physician relationship. Uh, there was an experimenter and subject relationship. Dr. Sanger has acknowledged uh, on one occasion that at least eight people had their lives shortened as a result of this uh, experiment. That means that these people were killed by the radiation and not by the cancers. It may be uncertain how many were killed in the radiation experiment. Some say eight, others as many as 20. But there is no such uncertainty about why these 88 people were given radiation. A report written by Dr. Eugene Sanger himself in 1963 to the Department of Defense spelt out the exact aims of the project. I quote, These studies are designed to obtain new information about the metabolic effects of total and partial body radiation so as to obtain a better understanding of these acute and subacute effects in human beings. This information is necessary to provide knowledge on the combat effectiveness of troops. There is no mention in Sanger's report of any benefits to the patients from receiving these doses of radiation. What the military wanted to know is obvious. How would troops react on the battlefield after having been heavily radiated by atom bombs? If they were alive, the most likely answer is not very well. This was shown by the huge studies done on the surviving populations of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But age and fitness are factors too. So whether experiments on the old, infirm and cancerous patients used by Sanger's team were relevant is uncertain. Doris Baker asked why so many of the test subjects were poor and black and threw other worries to the advisory committee they came to town. Now some 30 plus years later, we the families are suffering and in great pain from our hearts and very angry about the story of what really happened to our loved ones. First, they gave them a damn number. Then they gave them a checkout call. Then they called the illiterate poor and went so far as to call some of them crazy. They charted them like they were meat in a packing house. Then they burned them with their damn radiation. They radiated some of them so much that they were cooked like meat. My God, how could some do something like that to human beings? Dr. Sanger and his team believed that they were working for some larger good. The preservation of combat effectiveness and the salvation of some select elite in the event of a nuclear war. They knew that their actions would cause pain and death and suffering for individuals, some of which you have seen evidence of here today. But they believed that it was worth it for the attainment of some larger good. They believed it. They really believed it. And so did the physicians we hanged at Nuremberg. Thus, Jeffrey C., a campaigner for all radiation victims, reminded the members of the advisory committee of what had been decided in the aftermath of World War II. For the Nuremberg Code was a watershed for all forms of medical experimentation. It made very clear the need for patient consent and patient benefit. So is it possible to argue that medical ethics were different in the 50s and 60s? Because if the patients didn't give informed consent to these experiments, then their legal and constitutional rights had been infringed. This is one of the main planks in the case being argued by the lawyers for the victims. But there were serious, high-level conflicts about the need for research on human subjects. The military wanted to run radiation tests on normals, fit young males. The Atomic Energy Commission, the civilian body which had taken over responsibility for making and testing atom bombs, resisted. From documents discovered, Eileen Walsam describes a meeting in 1950 between the military chiefs and Shields Warren, 
who was then in charge of a medical division of the Atomic Energy Commission. It was clear that they believed that a nuclear war was imminent, and they were preparing for it. And they had a lot of questions, and they wanted those questions answered. And in the midst of all this, this gentleman, Shields Warren, who was a Boston doctor, who I really think is one of the heroes of this whole story, argued against doing total body irradiation experiments on prisoners. And when one of the generals or admirals said, well, you know, we're only going to pick volunteers and, and, you know, we're going to tell them what we're going to do with them, and he responded something to the effect, well, we just got through hanging people in Germany for that. Martha Stevens has no doubt about the wrongness of the treatment given to one woman, patient number 44, in the radiation experiment at Cincinnati General Hospital, run by the team of doctors under Eugene Sanger. Maud Jacobs, a woman of 49, who was at home taking care of three children. She had breast cancer, but she was still living a fairly normal life. She was housekeeping, she was cooking supper. She got herself to the hospital, called her own taxi. One of her older children came over to keep the children because they had told her to come in for a treatment. That's all, a treatment. And she was given 150 rads of total body radiation. She went home afterwards. And the next day she was violently ill and was taken back to the hospital. And 25 days later, she was dead. She had gone out of her mind, for the most part, and f her daughter says constantly told them that she felt like she was on fire. The way radiation is measured has changed many times over the last hundred years. A rad is just one measure of radiation dose. It's an inexact science. But the big picture has been absolutely clear since August 1945. Studies at Hiroshima and Nagasaki showed that a dose of 400 rads would kill half the people so exposed. Thus, 150 rads given to more Jacobs was a pretty high dose, quite sufficient to cause radiation sickness, vomiting, diarrhoea, loss of mental faculties, and damage to blood production. More Jacobs' symptoms were those of radiation sickness. Her eldest daughter, Lillian, remembers very clearly how her mother felt after being given radiation. She actually was burning alive in that bed from this radiation and I didn't know what was going on to me it was just cancer and she couldn't do anything but just sit there with a bucket and vomit I, I said uh, mom what did they give you and she said I got some pain pills here you know she's talking about pain pills she didn't know what they did to her out there she had no idea they did that to her I know she wouldn't have she wouldn't have consented to it anyway because she had three kids to try to figure out what was going to happen to them after she died. We knew back in 71 from her summary in the doctor's reports that they assumed no one would ever see but the uh, supervisors in the Defense Department that Maud Jacobs had a normal blood count before her radiation. That is given in her chart. Seven days after the radiation, her blood counts began to fall. And they went down to very little, a few days before she died. And then I come to realize what had happened to her with all this research and all this stuff. Then I went back in my mind and I knew the things that happened to her, that that's the things that radiation does to people. I saw my mother talk out of her head. Her, she lost her mind. She said, Lil, she said, don't let these people touch me. They're making me worse. They're not helping me. If everything that is alleged is true about Eugene Sanger, what he did is unspeakable. Because certainly at least eight people died as a result of the radiation, and perhaps as many as 20. And the documents clearly show that Dr. Sanger and his colleagues knew that these patients were getting sick, and they knew that any radiation over 150 rads had grave 
deleterious effects on those people. And you, all you have to do is look at the documents and see, okay, radiation on such and such a date, death on day 28. You know, the conclusions are inescapable and unavoidable. The legal case brought by the families is just about to end, but the decision won't be nearly as clear-cut as Eileen Wilson's opinion. Judge Sandra Beckwith has been in charge of a Cincinnati case since it started. At the end of last month, she heard the final arguments for and against an agreed out-of-court settlement. The lawyers have done a deal, but Judge Beckwith still has to decide whether it's fair. Under the deal, the families will get a total of four and a quarter million dollars between them, on the condition that they drop their case against the doctors and the other parties forever. So after the legal costs of the class action have been deducted, each family will get about $70,000. There are some other less important items in the settlement. But a few families are very unhappy with this legal deal. They feel that the money is far too little and that the doctors are getting away with it. They know that the families of the plutonium injection victims got nearly half a million dollars each and an apology from the government. But Dr. Sanger's lawyer sees things differently. He is Joseph Parker, and he is also lead lawyer for all the doctors. He feels that a strong defence could have been mounted, even though they finally agreed to settle. The uh, work that these doctors did before it was stopped was the same work that led to a Nobel Prize about 20 years later, something that is probably not commonly understood. This was cutting-edge medicine in the sense of using the radiation for treatment of cancers, which before that time had been thought not to be treatable, and realizing that if they worked with bone marrow transplantation at the same time, they could be much more effective in, in relieving the symptoms of cancer. Judge Beckwith has made a number of important decisions as the case has moved slowly forward over the past couple of years. First, she dismissed claims by the doctors that such experiments were ethically permissible in the 60s. In another judgment, Beckwith said that the constitutional rights of the victims had been infringed by the radiation experiment. Bob Newman, who has led the class action brought by the families, is very pleased by the way the judge has handled the case. Judge Beckwith's magnificent decision condemning the United States uh, and, and all those involved for having done the experiments, experiments as we have alleged them, and we believe that the allegations in our complaint are, are, are true. They conceded those allegations for the purposes of the legal proceedings that we've, we've gone through to date. So we have a legal decision uh, that's very important and of great precedental value in this country regarding governmental activity and human experimentation, saying that, that it was clearly established in the 60s and forward that it was a violation of one's constitutional rights to do the experiments that were done as we've alleged in the complaint. That precedent has enabled other lawyers in the country to bring their suits against the government. That was the first case. Beckwith's decision was the first case. Three family groups are standing out against the settlement. Doris Baker is not among them, but even she has her reservations particularly about the matter of guilt. It's not about the money. It's about proving what they did and making them accept the fact that they were wrong. You know, the money is a little part of it, but it's mainly about what they did. And they can, you know, they can a lot of family members do a whole lot of pain. We suffering as, as bad as our relatives that went through this. We're suffering too, twice, because we had to bear them once. And now it's like we got to bury them again. Joseph Parker says that although the doctors will never admit to any wrongdoing, and though they have not appeared in court, they nonetheless have been hurt by all the publicity. It is not fun to read in the headlines of your local newspaper that you have committed atrocities. It, in some ways, is ironic and even more painful to him because he's been compared to the doctors at Auschwitz, Dr. Sanger is a Jew, as are most of the doctors in this. They find that hurtful in words I can't even describe. Never for a moment has he expressed any doubt that he was right in what he has done. He ha will never apologize for what he has done. He is proud of it. 
and he just wants to get this case behind him because it he is 80 years old and he doesn't want to spend the last few years of his life in the courtroom. So if money is paid over, what happens to a matter of guilt when there's a legal deal? Are there any guilty parties? That's one of the things you give up when you settle a case, and that's typical in any kind of uh, settlement in this country, that neither side admits guilt, that neither side takes off his shirt and gets lashed, uh, that ne neither side is judged to be uh, the victor or the, uh, the vanquished. So Sanger is going to be able to walk away from the settlement uh, saying that the case was settled and I did not have to admit wrongdoing. And that is certainly what he, he wants. But I think in the context of the Radiation Advisory Committee proceedings, the Beckwith decision, and what this settlement is all about, the amount of money that is being paid, I think we know where the chips fall. So Bob Newman thinks that the mere fact that money is being paid by the defendants means that most people will know where the rights and wrongs of the case really lie. It's not clear just who is going to contribute what to the four and a quarter million dollars going to the families. The government, the city, the university will each no doubt pay their bit. But it's the money and opinion of the doctors' insurance companies which would favour a settlement. They would not want to write an open-ended cheque. The large family of Maud Jacobs are strongly against this settlement. They'd gathered together in Lillian Pagano's sitting room in the suburbs of Cincinnati, she being the eldest daughter. Her brother and a younger sister were also there, along with one of her own daughters. A large spread of food had been prepared, but remained untouched as they spoke bitterly of what had happened. They produced a picture of a healthy-looking Maud Jacobs, just before her treatment in hospital. Lillian spoke first. The compensation that was offered was very... It was an insult. We have seven children in our family... Her life was much more than that. And the money is not the real issue here. Justice is what we want. Justice is what the United States is supposed to stand for. Justice for all. We want the world to know what he has done. This doctor. You're against the settlement, but if it takes another ten years? I don't care what it takes, how long it takes. I want justice. Maud Jacobs had six children in all, but only three of them, all girls and all under the age of ten, were still living at home. While she was in hospital, these three went to stay with their elder sister Lillian, who already had her own family. The eldest of the three little girls was Sherry. Well, I stayed with Lil for a while, about six months, but she had seven kids of her own, so that's a lot of kids. And we were all, except for two or three of them, pretty little. And you know how kids will fight back and forth, especially it's like two different families try to live together. So uh, we ended up in St. Aloysius Orphanage on Redding Road. And how long did you stay there? You had to uh, leave there when you got out of the eighth grade, but once you went into high school... You had to leave the orphanage and either go home with relatives or they tried to find a foster home for you. Or if all else fails, you were put in a um, correctional institution because you can't let a 14-year-old kid out by itself if you've got no place else to put it. That's where it goes. So where did you go at age 14? I went to live with my sister, Betty. And uh, Jan I had to leave Jan and Kim behind for a couple years. So in a way affects the three youngest in a much more direct way. Yeah, I'd end up splitting us up because uh, no one in the family was financially well off enough to take the three of us. So uh, I was really close to a nervous breakdown. But they sent Kim to a foster home. That's why she's in Milwaukee. So we didn't even get to grow up together. A family broken up and destroyed by their mother's sudden death. But a family now united in vocal and forceful opposition to the settlement. The family of Maud Jacobs, patient number 45, are also united by the new knowledge that the opening up of the story has brought them. One of Lillian's married daughters, Betty Allen, is amazed by what she has learnt 
but also at how hard others find it to believe. Even like my husband's family, it's like when we start to tell them some of the things that we heard, they just... Don't believe? No. His brother-in-law just said to us two weeks ago, he said, it sounds like a, a scary movie or something that you got, like he doubted any of the things we were telling him. Like, nah, I don't know, that sounds like a movie you've seen or something. The final report of the Presidential Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments emerged in October 1995, nearly two years after it had been set up and nearly six months late. Many believed this extra time was used to rewrite the report and water down its conclusions. Certainly, just like the probable Cincinnati settlement, there are no guilty people. The final report is a doorstep of a document, 924 pages of research and deliberation, and it was all caused by Eileen Walsam and her articles in the Albuquerque Tribune. But she's less than happy with it. What aggravated me about the report is that these esteemed scientists and lawyers and historians took the easy way out. They blamed institutions, not people. I think that they were literally pummeled by the Defense Department and by these institutions with data. I mean, I don't think that they were intimidated by the data so much as overwhelmed by the data. They did not... The second thing is they ha we had a Republican Congress come in. The country was in a really stingy mood, so it was clear that they weren't going to have a mass giveaway to any kind of victims. I mean, in this country, I think the attitude is we're tired of victims, you know, so victims go away. You know, I am a registered voter, and I vote all the time, and um, very patriotic with the red, white, and blue and the 4th of July and stuff, and you better believe it, I will not be caught dead wearing red, white, and blue. <laughs> it's just, it's my own little personal form of civil disobedience. I, I believe in America, and I believe there's a lot of wonderful people here, and I believe these people were a little nuts, and I believe given a chance she'll make up for it, but until she makes up for it, I would shoot my kids in the foot before they went in the Army. That's how I feel about it. But the victims of radiation experiments from all over America are not going to go away. Many instead are becoming politicized. The victims are using the courts to get their due. And perhaps that's the right way. But it's very slow and can be very painful. For each side gets its day in court. And Martha Stevens found the latest encounter hard to bear. The defendants were allowed to put on a show of about three hours defending themselves and saying that uh, they were simply working on cancer. And what they did was, was therapy. And so that was... Uh, an amazing experience, really. It, it was so painful at times, I almost uh, decided to, I would have to get up and walk out, out for a while. And I think some of the family members felt that way. I saw people wandering into the halls. There was an absolute avalanche of untruths of the most patent type. Hardly, we could hardly believe our ears. Next week, America Atomica goes from Cincinnati to Washington State from the River Ohio to the River Columbia. At Hanford in Washington, they produced the world's first plutonium on an industrial scale in water-cooled reactors, water taken from and returned directly to the River Columbia. Again, there are damaged people, and again, it was a female journalist who broke the story. But Eileen Wilson will always have more questions. Could this happen again? Most certainly. For example, the Department of Defense is still doing breast cancer research. Now, my question is, why is the Department of Defense, of all departments, doing breast cancer research? Could this happen again? Most certainly. America Atomica was written and presented by John Slater. It was a Pierre Black Hill production by Peter Hall.